In this video, we'll be looking at the solution to the 2024-2025 general chemistry test questions. We'll take each of the questions and then provide the solution. The instruction here says attempt all questions and they said you should circle the correct answer. Okay, so we're going to be circling the answer from the instruction. Now, question one says the process of conversion of liquid of liquid water to gaseous water is known as all right. So the, the process of convert conversion of liquid to gaseous state is simply called evaporation. So in this case, the answer is evaporation. So you have your answer here as evaporation. So we'll circle evaporation. Okay. The next thing says the correct formula of calcium hypochlorite is now, to get this, you should know that calcium is Ca2 plus combined with the hypochlorite. The hypochlorite ion is actually ClO minus. So these two combine. Now, in the combination, we said the simple task is that the power here, which is minus 1 or simply minus, comes down here to so become Ca2 1 here. Of course, we'll take off the 1. Then this 2 comes this way here. So the two will come this way here. Now the fact that you have a polyatomic ion here, you put it in bracket. So in bracket, you now have ClO, then the two comes down here. All right, so Ca in bracket, ClO2 is your answer. So if you look at the last option, we have CaClO2, which is wrong because there's no bracket. So we'll take one that has a bracket, CaClO2. This is the correct answer. So we have this. So I'll cycle that. Next up, number three says compounds made of metals and non-metals are commonly known as the answer there is ionic compounds. So circle ionic compounds, that's the answer. So compounds made of metals and non-metals are commonly called ionic compounds. Number four there says the following are amorphous solid, except now when we say amorphous solid, they are solid that lacks definition in shape pattern and long range order right they are the opposite of crystalline solids okay crystalline solids are actually solids that have a definite shape and definite pattern right but amorphous solids are those solids that do not have a definite shape or definite pattern right so in this case the answer there would be salt salt is not um, an amorphous solid salt is actually a crystalline solid so the answer is salt all right so glass Candle wax, that means glass, candle wax, rubber are all amorphous um, solids, right? But five says the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in the empirical formula of hydrogen peroxide is. All right, so for this, note that the empirical formula of hydrogen peroxide is HO, all right? Why the molecular formula is H2. O2. Now you're asked for empirical formula, which is this. So for this one, I have one atom of hydrogen as well as one atom of oxygen. That's for the empirical formula. If you ask for the molecular formula, it becomes two atoms of hydrogen and then two atoms of oxygen. But since we asked for, for the empirical formula, it becomes one is to one. So my answer here is one is to one. Please do want to increase the quality of your video so that you can see the questions clearer, okay? Number six, what is the molecular mass of hydrogen in two molecules of, you have C9, they give you C9H8O4, right? What you have is called aspirin, right? This compound is called aspirin, um, aspirin. Now you ask the molecular mass of hydrogen in two moles of this. That means I'll add two to the beginning. Now for hydrogen, it becomes 2 times the subscript here, which is 2 times 8, and that's equal to 16. So the answer there is 16. 16 grams. So the answer there is 16. Alright. Number 7 says, the, ion, the ions below are polyatomic, except, now, if you look at this, the only non-polyatomic ion here is CO. Now, don't get confused. The CO here is not capital C and capital O. Capital C, capital O would be carbon and oxygen. But when you have a C with a small O, the element there is called cobalt. It's called cobalt. So cobalt is just a single atom, right? 
you can see that so it becomes one atom why others have two atoms like the first one there has hydrogen carbon and oxygen that's triatomic the second one has oxygen but to base two or it has a subset of two which means two atoms of oxygen so the only one here that's a monoatomic would be cobalt so i'll circle this one here that's your answer number eight says the correct name of bcl3 is now we know that b is boron is boron yeah b is boron then cl cl is chlorine then three means three of chlorine so it becomes boron trichloride all right so the answer there is boron and then three of chlorine becomes trichloride that's your answer number nine says the neutrons were discovered by so who discovered neutrons the answer is james chadwick Right, so note that James Chadwick discovered the neutrons. That's your answer. Number 10 says, to remove the outermost electron from the sodium atom, the energy required is known as, the answer there is the first ionization energy. All right? So the answer there is first ionization energy. All right? So please do your circling better. All right? Do it better. So just circle this as first ionization energy. Number 11 says, the following exhibits hydrogen bonding, except, so which of these does not um, exhibit hydrogen bonding? The answer here is hydrogen sulfide, all right? Note that water exhibits hydrogen bonding, also ammonia also exhibits hydrogen bonding, but hydrogen sulfide, H2S, does not exhibit that. All right, number 12 Number 12 says the following is not correct about cathode ray, right? Number one, it is negatively charged. That's correct. Cathode ray is negatively charged. Number two, it is deflected by magnetic field. Of course, since it has charges, it will be deflected by magnetic field. Next one says it is neutral, right? This neutral, it's, it's not true, right? It is not neutral. So the answer here is it is neutral. No, cathode ray is not neutral. All right, number 13. 13 says element X has two stable isotopes. That's X10 with mass 10.0129 and X11 with mass 11.009 AMU. That's atomic mass units. Having relative abundances of 19.78% and 80.22% respectively. Calculate the relative atomic mass of element X. Well, that's simple. I'll just take the first um, atomic mass, which is this one here. 10 points becomes 10.0129 multiplied by the relative abundance, which in this case is 19.78%. So multiplied by 19.78 all over 100. That's percentage. Okay. This plus, pick up the next one there. The next one there would be 11.009. That's uh, 11.009. This times um, what we have here is 80.22. It becomes 80 points. Let's see this again 80.22%. That's 22 all over 100. So you have this. All right, so you just get your calculator and punch this correctly. So if you punch this, you'd have your answer as let me just punch this quickly and see what we have. Um, if you want to, you could express this one here as a decimal first, and then this one here as a decimal. That will be about 0 0.197. This would be about 0 0.1978. This would be about 8, 0.8022. Then you can punch this. If I punch this, my answer gives me about, my answer is about 10.812 approximately. So which option is 10.812? Uh, okay, so 10.811. I'll just go with this, but it should have been 812 approximately. All right, so I'll just circle this. That's your answer. All right, number 14 says, which of the following is not matter? You have water, you have shadow, you have milk, you have neutrons. The answer here is shadow. Okay, shadow is not matter. Others are matter. All right, number 15 says, smog is a dash mixture. That's 15. Smog is a dash mixture. The answer here between alif. The first thing here is amphilic. You have heterogeneous, homogeneous, 
amphigenous? The answer here is heterogeneous. So please note that smog is actually a heterogeneous mixture, right? For heterogeneous mixture, we have that the components are not evenly distributed, okay? So for a heterogeneous mixture, the components that make up the mixture, they are not evenly distributed and they can be distinguished from one another and smoke falls under that category. Next one, 16 says, the shape of this, this is carbon dioxide, is dash. The answer there is linear, right? Carbon dioxide is linear. The next thing there, 17 says, the diagram disobeys dash principle or rule, right? So here's your diagram. Uh, let me draw this out and then let's show something. There's something, the answer here actually is Hunt's rule, okay? For the Hunt's rule concept, let's say we have an orbital like this. Let's say we have a p orbital like this. The concept of Hunt's rule say, if I'm to arrange, let's say, five electrons here, okay? Hunt's rule concept says we must fill them singly first. So it becomes one, two, three. So you must fill them singly before you now start pairing them. So it becomes four and then five. This is a simple concept of Hunt's rule. But if you look at the question there, we now have something that looks like this. Um, let me take this one off and then take this one off here. So what do you observe? This is what the question looks like. What do you observe? Observe that this one here was being paired even when this one was not filled up. So it disobeys Hunt's rule. That's the concept. So the answer there is Hunt's rule. So I would come and I would circle Hunt's rule. So that's it. 18 says, yellow light has a wavelength of 589 nanometer. The frequency of the radiation um, is what we know is that um, first things first, they call it light, and for light, we have that speed of light C is equal to F times what there? Lambda. Now we know that C is a constant 3 times 10 to the power 8. That's a constant, is equal to is equal to if you look at here, they give you the value here, three point speed of light equal to 3.00 times 10 to the power 8. You can see it's there there. Is equal to the frequency which we asked to find. So frequency times wavelength. They give the wavelength as 589. Then nano. This small n shows nano. And nano is simply times 10 to the power minus 9. So if you have to find the value of frequency, it's just divide here and divide here by 589 times 10 to the power minus 9. 589 times 10 to the power minus 9. This will cancel this. So the frequency will be equal to, I'll just get my calculator and punch this. That's 3 times 10 to the power 8, all divided by 589 times 10 to the power minus 9. And if I do that, that's about 5.093 times 10 to the power, 10 to the power 14 hertz. All right. Let's see which option is that. Um, 5.09 times 10 to the power 14 hertz or per second. All right. Hertz and per second are the same thing. That's the first option here. 5.09 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. All right. Either hertz or per second. Is the same thing. So that's your answer. Let's look at the next question there. Next up there, question 19 says, which of the following does not qualify as a chemical change? Don't forget that a chemical change is a kind of change that is irreversible. The first thing that you have is boiling of water. Boiling of water is reversible. Okay. If you boil water, it becomes gaseous. If you keep the gas for some time, um, it will condense. So it's reversible. So I will circle this. So boiling of water is actually reversible. So it is not a chemical chain. And hence, that's our first answer. The next one there says, the solution of sodium chloride in water. This is simply putting salt in water. If I put salt in water and I stir it, it becomes a salt solution. Now that salt solution, if I heat it, if I put it in um, maybe a pot or a kettle, right, and I heat it, the water will evaporate, leaving the salt particles, right, in that container or material. So hence, this also does not qualify as a chemical change. So that means there are about two answers here so far. So this also does not qualify as a chemical change. Next, they said the shelling of boiled egg, right? If I if I deshell boiled egg, so if I boil egg and remove the shell, 
there's no way I can put the shell back. So here is a chemical change. Then the next one, there's all of the above. No, that's not there. So we have two answers for this question. And that's what you have there. The final question there, question 20. Uh, let me take this off first. Question 20 says, the oxidation number of carbon in H2CO is, so I have H2CO, right? We are asked to find the oxidation number of carbon here. So how do we find that? First things first, for hydrogen, the oxidation number of hydrogen is plus 1 multiplied by the number of atoms there, 2, so it becomes 2, plus coming to carbon, we assume we don't know it, so we call it X, plus for oxygen, the oxygen number is minus 2. We equate this to 0. 1 times 2 is 2 plus x plus minus is minus 2. It's equal to 0. From here, you now have 2 minus 2 cancels out. So x is equal to 0. So the answer is 0 there, which is what you have here. So circle 0 as we asked. So basically, this is how we answer this question. Okay, so this is the full solution to this particular year. All right. Alright guys, don't forget that if you enjoyed this video, do all to like this video, okay? Hit the like button, leave a comment. For your comments, tell us if you enjoyed the video in the comment section. Don't forget to also subscribe. If it's your first time here or you're yet to subscribe, please do all to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon and select all so that you get notified whenever we upload a new video. Then finally, share this video to your friends so that they can also learn, okay? Don't forget to visit my website www.jonahimano.com forward slash courses and also check out my books at www.jonahimano.com forward slash books, right? Register an account to the website and then proceed to get any of the available courses or books, right? You can also join my channel membership, right? You can also join my first year students channel membership to get access to exclusive content. I'll leave a link to both my website as well as my channel membership in the video description. All right. So many thanks and see you in our next class.